Welcome to another episode of the Indus Face Sastrana podcast. Today we have with us Srikanth Rajagopalan. Srikanth is the CEO at Perfios Account Aggregation Services. Srikanth is also the co-chair of the Data Privacy Working Committee at FICCI. Today in this podcast, Srikanth throws some light on how businesses has to look at security through the lens of data on how privacy and data privacy and application security is important, not just for providing the differentiation and earning the trust of customers, but with the new Privacy Act coming in place, it is important they pay attention to it for their very survival. All right, uh, welcome to this Astrana podcast, Rekhan. Pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to uh, meet with you as well, Venkat. Venkat. Yeah, all right. Uh, so, Srikan, you have had a very interesting journey. I've been following you. Uh, from uh, selling paints to sodas to uh, plastic cards to getting into fintech startups. So it's, right now you're in a data platform. So soda to data is my moniker about describing <laughs> you. Uh, so, but anyway, can you tell a little bit about yourself, Srikanth, and uh, so that the audience can know more about you? Yeah, thanks for that uh, uh, introduction. So yes, yeah, as, you, as you said, I mean, I uh, kind of started life as a sales guy. Um, it, you know, as a sales guy, I found my way through durables to sodas and then uh, accidentally landed up uh, a job at Amex because mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I can if I can sell soda, I can sell a plastic card, right? It's just another sales job, right? Uh, <laughs> but then that started the love affair with payments, right? Mm-hmm. Amex was a very unique place. They, use, they run what is called a closed loop network, which means they get to see the transaction end to end. And that's got mm-hmm. some fascinating, fascinating data insights, right? From the mm-hmm. point of uh, understanding a customer, underwriting her, uh, you know, then you know, giving her a card, tracking her spending behavior, and then mapping it to your merchant coverage. No other mm-hmm. card network gives you that kind of visibility. So it mm-hmm. was a fantastic seven-year, eight-year learning experience. I worked mm-hmm. with some of the best minds in the industry. Um, some of the some of them are still mentors, the people that I worked with. But then eventually, mm-hmm. you know, I got bored of a corporate career. I had mm-hmm. Two promotions, three raises, you know, you know mm-hmm. how it works, right? And then yeah. you kind of get bored. In 2007, mm-hmm. uh, this whole concept of uh, something to do on a mobile, payments, commerce, etc., was just, you know, at its very, very initial stages at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The reminder, back then we were in the era of 2.5G networks, right? You had to send yeah, a message yeah. to your uh, operator to get an internet session. It wasn't ambient like it was uh, like it is today, right? Mm-hmm. And the smartest phone was a Nokia E51, which was a QWERTY keyboard, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so back in the day, um, I found a, a techie through a mutual introduction, and he says, mm-hmm. you know, this whole mobile bandwidth is not being used well. There is a lot of empty space where you can do transactions rather than just voice and SMS. So the mm-hmm. idea was simple: can you can you uh, install a 64 KB app on a Nokia mm-hmm. feature phone mm-hmm. and help people transact on that, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and as audacious as it sounds today in hindsight, we were able to pull off um, an app. I mean, we called it NGPay or Next Generation mm-hmm. Pay. I mean, frankly, it was a lack of imagination or any, any other better word, right? <laughs> so we were able to aggregate a bunch of merchants, over 50 merchants, who had mm-hmm. stuff to sell, right? We started with the mm-hmm. usual, your plane mm-hmm. tickets and flight tickets and stuff like that and, and train tickets. Mm-hmm. IRCTC was a major merchant on board. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then we found in those days, you know, distribution was a big problem. Right? Mm-hmm. Because you didn't have app stores, you didn't have any anybody but a carrier who was a gatekeeper. Uh, mm-hmm. So we instead went to the merchant and said, you know what, uh, help me distribute this app and I can help mm-hmm. you reduce the distribution costs for your own product. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So things started taking off. Um, we were that hockey stick really started off in about early 2008. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We got a term sheet from mm-hmm. a very storied um, Silicon Valley investor. Mm-hmm. But as it happens, they gave us a valuation on you know last year's numbers, but not the current run rate. The mm-hmm. typical mm-hmm. Found, founder, you know, uh, swag and swagger, he said, "Hey, you know mm-hmm. what? I'm actually I'm going to end up." 3x the number that you're going to uh, going to give me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. challenge accepted. They said, okay, come back to me in six mm-hmm. months. Show me that you meet these numbers, and that valuation is yours. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, so from conservative, we went full ballistic in terms of marketing spend and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I still remember names like AdMob and a uh, yeah. whole bunch of other, you know, uh, Jurassic tools that we used to get going. <laughs> With the result that uh, we were kind of going to run out of money by December. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by September, Lehman crisis hit. Mm -hmm. And yeah. any any uh, you know VC worth its worth their money who was like you know kind of following up with us, mm -hmm. you know the story became the joke became that they were calling us कि यहाँ पे कोई नौकरी है क्या बता? Yeah, but lesson learned. But um, the reason I dived a little deeper on this one is this was a kind of a you know pivot moment, which mm -hmm. said that you know what we've been fooling ourselves with uh, little green pieces of plastic and black boxes at a merchant counter. Mobile is a way to go if you really want to transact, if you really want to scale any digital product or service in this country with its you know, complexities. It has to be mobile first. Way ahead of your times. Way ahead of it your was, times at that time. In hindsight, at that yeah. time, it was in hindsight, it was far ahead of its time. In fact, yeah. uh, as an anecdote, uh, Flipkart started uh, three months after us. They were two blocks away in Koromangla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And as fate would have it, eventually we had to shut down and we kind of did a fire sale to Flipkart. Right? So mm -hmm. this guy. Um, but then moving on. So, you know, uh, all of us had to pack up and leave and uh, had to find my way back to a corporate career. Fortunately, at that mm -hmm. point, we had a good partnership going with Nokia uh, mm -hmm. and they were setting up mobile money. Uh, so the story continued and we uh, set up with a bunch of us who set up uh, mobile money at that at that point of time at Nokia. Okay. okay. Um, so one thing led to another, and eventually found my way to Amazon, where they mm -hmm. were kind of starting their India journey. And you know, if you look back, as uh, the great Steve Jobs said, uh, said, you can connect the dots. I've always been in a startup environment, no matter which company yeah. I work yeah. for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I joined Amazon when the website was five weeks old. We were selling mm -hmm. books and CDs. And yeah. uh, person number three and a half on the payments team, that half is still up for debate because one guy joined in the morning and joined at lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, those were again the early days of um, you know e-commerce payments. Um, okay. Success rates and you know the kind of quality of service you would find from banks was just not up to the mark. So we had a big role to play in actually collectively working with financial institutions, card networks, the uh, mm -hmm. regulator, and actually improving the customer experience for you know uh, people checking out and actually a genuine intent to buy, but being held up by a poor purchase experience. Right? Mm -hmm. We started with about 85% cash on delivery just because of friction reasons. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think today they're at, a, they're at the opposite, about 10% cash on delivery. Wow, wow. Right? It's That's mind-blowing numbers. Just, just mind-blowing numbers. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So along the way, then uh, you know, UPI came about. Uh, I still remember mm -hmm. that April 2016 at the Taj in Bangalore. Uh, Nandan was a guy who uh, actually, you know, so-called cut the ribbon and did the tech launch. Right? Mm -hmm. And he kind of you know simplified things like only a genius can, right? He says that mm -hmm. all that we're doing is that we are federating an ID and authentication. Right. Mm -hmm. The bank continues to do uh, KYC and account management. Mm -hmm. All that we're doing is to federate ID and authentication. That's it. That's the mm -hmm. most frictionful yeah. part, but the least value added part. We're taking that pain away from you. Mm -hmm. right? And then look yeah. what's happened there. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, so that journey with Amazon continued. Uh, AWS set up shop, which is where we, you and I met uh, when we were trying to sell cloud to financial services institutions, yeah. you know, yeah. honestly, we had to start with C for C for chocolate, L for laddu, you know, <laughs> what is cloud? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What fascinating journey. And, um, you know, I think our timing is also right because at that time, UPI was beginning to scale. It was putting a lot of load on, you know, IT systems. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, AWS and then other cloud providers, you know, became a kind of a pressure release system for them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that journey uh, was there till about 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I was in the thick of it, I realized I was like spending 20 days in a plane, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes waking up in a hotel and you know looking at the hotel directory to figure out which country or which city I'm in. 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that wasn't working. So, um, so then I kind of, you know, decided to gear down a bit and, mm -hmm. and said that, um, um, fortunately at that time, I got introduced to Gobi, who's the founder of Perpios, um, mm -hmm. through a mutual, mutual connect. Um, mm -hmm. At that time, Perpios was about a tenth of our size today. We were looking mm -hmm. at exactly like you said before we started, going from a zero to one to a one to hundred company. Right? Mm -hmm. The skills and the talent and everything that we needed were very different from what a founder could bring to the table. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so that that journey started off in 2019. Uh, and very mm -hmm. quickly along the way, we found that this whole account aggregation piece, mm -hmm. if we did it well, if we strategized well, could be a orbit change um, uh, scale mechanism for our business. Right? And mm -hmm. I think we'll come to that when we talk about perfumes and what we do. So, um, you know, you're asking a sales guy to talk. So at the risk of talking a lot, <laughs> no, it's all, it's all, it's, it's a fascinating journey and there's a logic and there is a progression and the reason behind what happened in the next step, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a very fascinating journey. Yeah. It's Go a ahead. Fascinating journey. Yeah. I think the, um, so where we are today and probably segue into maybe the next question that you wanted to ask, which is about telling me about Puff Yours and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so essentially what we do at Perfios is to automate a lot of the rules-based processing uh, for mm -hmm. financial institutions. That could be onboarding, could be analytics, could be post-sanction, you know, monitoring, anything which can be, uh, can be defined by a set of rules, which needs, uh, which needs data to be extracted from various sources, cleaned up, annotated, and mm -hmm. then put into that so-called logic engine. That's what we do, the end-to-end, -end, right? Okay. When we started off, we had to really build those proprietary pipes into a lot of these uh, banks, right? So for you mm -hmm. to get your data from any bank or, or, or a mutual fund or, or insurance uh, a company, uh, mm -hmm. we had to build those proprietary data pipes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And even today, um, the number one um, limiting factor to any of our, you know, us or any of our competitors' growth is the friction mm -hmm. that people face in fetching their data. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, if you're a totally organized person and you've downloaded six months of your bank statements as a PDF mm -hmm. and you remember the passwords and you try mm -hmm. and upload it onto a Bajaj Finance site, uh, you see where I'm going with this, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So in that happy case, we kind of, you know, get some, uh, you know, we make some revenues as per yours in terms of automating some of these sales. Right? Yeah. Uh, so this whole account aggregation piece, though still a little nascent, is mm -hmm. meant to solve exactly that problem. I mean, if, if you if you remember simply just one thing about what is AA, what is account aggregation, mm -hmm. um, we have the potential to do to data what UPR did to money. Wow. That's a that's a that's a very ambitious. It's a very simplistic way of explaining it, but uh, data has got a lot more complexity, nuances, shapes exactly. and forms, and workflows associated with it than money. Money is uh, by two parties, two banks, and a transfer happens. Whereas and one data, SQ, yeah. one SQU with one sign here and one sign there, and the opposite sign. Yeah, there. that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but you're right. I mean, data is a whole new ball game. Uh, yeah. But it's a concept. Us, it's a very ambitious goal to have. It's uh, it's quite amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely. And um, the way again, uh, Nandan puts it is that, you know, it's time that data principles were able to monetize mm -hmm. their own data, rather mm -hmm. than the data platforms. Wow, deep, very deep, deep. very yeah. deep. Yeah. So amazing. So so that's how Perpios was born. Tell me a little bit more about with how this grand vision translated into some sort of a reality. Where are you today right now? And I just now saw your campaign, Perfiosness, uh, a new campaign that you guys launched. So tell me what does Perfiosness mean? What does what does this term being what UPI was to money that Perfios is going to be data? Where do you stand today in that journey? And can you give me a few use cases where you are actually making life easier? Uh, starting with a disorganized person not having those six months of bank trans, uh, trans, uh, statements with me. How do you make life easy for such people? Okay, uh, let me answer that on 
uh, two levels. Uh, just for context, we are uh, we are actually two different organizations. Perfios, okay. the mothership, is the B two B SaaS platform, which okay. essentially counts about eight hundred odd financial institutions in India and uh, twenty other countries as okay. its clients. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So our core product offering is analytics, decision decision automation, so on and so forth, and process automation. Using mm -hmm. uh, our secret sauce of being able to extract, um, annotate, categorize, and work with data. Right. Mm -hmm. So our core competence is being able to deal with data. Mm -hmm. The way we put that to use is to is to help financial institutions automate most rules based uh, decision. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the entity that I run uh, officially mm -hmm. is uh, a regulated entity. We have a license from the Reserve Bank of India to be what is called an account aggregator. Right. OK. OK. Um, in simple terms, uh, an account aggregator really has um, four parties in this whole ecosystem. The first mm -hmm. and the most one, most important person is the data principal, people like you mm -hmm. and I. Mm -hmm who mm -hmm. happen to have an account at, let's say, SPI. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're checking out at an Amazon website and you have a loan offer or EMI offer from, let's say, let's pick a name, Bajaj Finance, right? Mm -hmm. Bajaj says, fine, I can I can help you finance this 50-inch TV. Just give me six months of your bank statement. Mm -hmm. Today, that's where trouble starts. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. What we're able to do is help Bajaj connect directly mm -hmm. through people like us. Anumati is our brand name. Anumati is the account aggregator that I run. Okay. Through us, they can go straight to an SBI saying, here is Venkatesh's mobile number. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize this uh, mobile number? Do you have a bank account linked to this mobile number? Mm -hmm. If yes, please give me six months of data. Okay. Right. So it's a set of protocols, it's a set of APIs that that is standardized across. Today we serve. Um, uh, okay, so so the first entity was you. You're you're shopping for a loan. You want to yeah. get your bank statements. SBI here is the financial information provider. Okay. Right? Or the FIP. You have your mm -hmm. data there, and on demand they're supposed to share your data because ultimately it's your data. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Bajaj is the finance financial information user or the FIU. They're the guys mm -hmm. who need your data in order to give you some product or service. Mm -hmm. Conceptually fairly simple. There are there is a giver of data, there mm -hmm. is a user of data, and there is a mediator called an account aggregator, which makes sure that all the permissions and all the uh, security protocols are appropriately deployed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. today the network today we have is 46 FIPs, right? Mm -hmm. Which is uh, banks and financial insurance FIPs, companies. financial institution provider, right? Financial FI, information FI. providers. Information provider, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there are some 46 FIPs currently live. Um, okay. There are about 200 FIUs. Mm -hmm. uh, remember a Bajaj who's seeking your data, a financial information user. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, about 200 odd of them who are actively experimenting with A as a as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not the only account aggregator. I mean, there are some uh, 14 of us uh, in the market, so it is fairly competitive. Mm -hmm. It is quite, yeah. you know, uh, interesting to put it mildly in terms of um, how we compete. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. So uh, look at an account aggregator as a consent manager who. Um, is responsible and accountable to to the data principle. Mm -hmm. Acts on their behalf and says, OK, Venkatesh wanted his six months of bank statement from SBI to be mm -hmm. shared with Bajaj. And here is mm -hmm. two or three buttons you need to press. A couple of OTPs come and your data goes securely between the two systems without any man in the middle. Right. Okay. Uh, and and you can you can start seeing the benefits of that from a security authenticity uh, real time point of view, right? I mean, compared mm -hmm. to compared to what is what is today's best case alternative if if, if you're not savvy customer, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You call somebody home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then it takes its own sweet yeah. It takes its own sweet time, <laughs> not in minutes. Certainly, uh, yeah. 
and uh, you you you're in bombay right uh, yeah i've been bangalore i live in bangalore yeah if you go to bombay there is a place called chandivli which is the mm-hmm. hub of all this uh, processing paper processing by banks right mm-hmm. i've had uh, bhelpuri on somebody's uh, bank statement <laughs> a print out of somebody's bank statement yeah it's yeah that is yeah. scary i can't tell you how yeah. scary it is right yeah yeah Yeah, so, Chandigarh so, sounds like pretty similar to Ullas Nagar. Ullas Nagar is also famous for these kind of things. For well, these kind uh, of things, I mean, I mean at least yeah. Chandigarh has got its legitimacy because it's got the BTOs, it's got okay. the process okay. centers. Yeah, uh, but you know, you you see the potential of uh, uh, things that we don't know is happening with your data in terms of leakages, misuse, reuse, and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, you don't even uh, you don't even know what kind of leakages are happening from a security or a permissions or a privacy point of view, and that's what we're trying to solve. Yeah, fantastic. I think it also ties back to the vision you stated that Nandan had, which is allow data to be monetized on its own, as opposed to some independent data platform providers providing monetization, and that's what to some extent Anumati as a platform and yeah. Perfio's account aggregation enables it. So Absolutely that right. eliminate the middleman, uh, eliminate any kind of independent data platform providers who are going to charge you money for doing the obvious, but just uh, at the point of use cases, at the point of need. In this case, the example you gave was a loan approval, mm-hmm. whatever was for a transaction and EMI converting a purchase into an EMI, whatever data collection needs to happen happens quickly between the consumer. the user and the uh, fiu fip and fius here right uh, absolutely that that happens automatically and it's a pretty lofty goal and very glad to hear that you have specific use cases where it is actually in action uh, translating that idea into real use cases and seeing some benefits uh, the thing that really caught my attention which made me feel good was you emphasize the word securely mm-hmm. right the entire thing has to happen securely uh and central to this entire security is data i mean the moment you are dealing with data security is going to take an elevated importance right and in, in, uh, and in fact every aspect of security has to be looked at from the eyes of data specifically customer data mm-hmm. and you being a data company uh, uh data aggregation company it's going to have in fact i would probably go ahead and say you are probably a security company as much as any other cyber security firm well because said. it is even data very well said yeah so uh, it i i'm just uh, going to go into the uh, your you i saw your linkedin profile and since you're talking about data you are also the co-chair at fi cci right uh, uh where That's part right. of the data production uh so can you give me some bullet points on the data privacy act that has come out in 2023 a long awaited data privacy act that has come out what do you think what are some of the key highlights uh from mm-hmm. your eyes and you, you you have been part of the committee as well so you can probably throw in a lot more insights and break that's it down right. for a layman that's what right. it means so so that's a great segue vacation to uh what is currently you know front and center in everybody's attention and uh, you know what is going to really really shape the course of the data economy in india um mm-hmm. this this bill has been in the works for the last 3 years starting with mm-hmm. the sri krishna committee report uh, mm-hmm. it's been through a bunch of changes and uh, some, somewhere along the way the scope got changed saying that we should also cover non personal data but mm-hmm. a lot of industry feedback and to the government's credit they've been very open to engaging with people like us from afiki and other uh, such um, uh, institutions um mm-hmm. finally the the directional decision that the mighty the mighty is the ministry of electronics and information technology that's it that's the arm of the government which has really put this together yeah. Yeah. uh what the mighty finally decided directionally after a lot of feedback was we shall simplify we will uh keep it very very specific to a single purpose called privacy and data protection and not muddle it with you know too much scope and too much of you know uh, bells and whistles mm-hmm. so from a intent perspective um their goal is very very clear that we need a law which ensures adequate protection for citizens data mm-hmm. with little to no disruption in day to day business operations mm-hmm. but a very very clear uh 
paradigm shift in terms of how data is handled and processed by people mm -hmm. who are in, as you call it, the data business, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is obviously a huge uh, trillion dollar economy, digital economy goal that the uh, government is consistently being pursuing. So, mm -hmm. so we see this as an enabler, a, a safe, protected uh, uh, data ecosystem is necessary. I mean, you have to feel secure, you have to feel safe that your data is not being misused if you have mm -hmm. to participate in the data economy, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the other few things that, uh, you know, directionally that they have chosen to, uh, chosen to, uh, you know, go down the path. One is they saying that this law applies only to digital data. Mm -hmm. If the data is in a paper form, it's out of scope. Mm -hmm. right? However, if that paper gets scanned and digitized, it's now within the ambit. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and you can see the uh, intent over here that if a person, if, if, if an average Joe wants to be assured that his rights are protected, mm -hmm. um, you trade off security for transparency. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, yeah. you participate in the formal economy, right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas Hitherto, you were data dark for whatever reasons, right? Mm -hmm. You make the trade off by saying, okay, I will open up, I will open up my data, I will digitize it in some form or manner in exchange for better services, faster, secure processing, and mm -hmm. the might of the law being behind you. That's the mm -hmm. first most important trade off that data principles start making, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Instead of keeping yeah. stuff under your pillow, mm -hmm. yeah. now in some, in, in, some, in some digital database. Yeah automatically you you know the government has got your back the mm -hmm. law has got your back right? yeah the flip side to that is a lot of data fiduciaries right mm -hmm. uh, will need to go a mindset change and this is the hard part right till now there's been this greed for getting as much data as you can whether or not you need it dekha jayega right mil raha data you know you're getting data just grab it with both hands stuff it in yeah. some Somewhere, somewhere, else, we'll figure out what to do with it later. Yeah, that behavior will need to change. I think the the guiding principle is going to be uh, data minimization and purpose limitation. Right? Yeah, if you don't need to know what car I drive in order to give me a you know EMI, mm -hmm. then don't ask me. Right? Yeah, 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 Absol yeah. Makes sense. So uh, uh, I I I, I uh, connected back to this uh, Netflix series that came. I think it was called uh -huh. Inconvenient Truth. Uh -huh. I think inconvenient truth. I forgot the name. It was there was a Netflix series around uh, the social uh, economy, Facebook, the social and, network. Yeah, 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 yeah. Around the entire. And then somebody out there mentioned that exactly the point you mentioned that that there has to be a responsibility of people who are collecting data, and one way to make sure that the responsible behavior behavior is enforced is the idea was to have something called as a data tax. Mm -hmm. a tax for every byte of data that you have for the citizens or the users. So it's a very interesting thought process. Here you're not talking about taxation, but you're talking about in principle, the data fiduciary should show some responsibility in terms of the data, the okay. purpose for which they collect, right? So it's a, okay. it's it, it seems like a conceptually a step in the right direction and the law is behind you. Uh, exactly. Probably in this case through some sort of penalties or something. Yeah, exactly continue, right. continue your line of thought. Sorry to interrupt, but I no felt, problem at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a conversation, not a uh, yeah. you know, not a monologue. Hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. um, see, there are a few nuances that it is important to keep in mind when you're running a, a data business. Right? Yeah, uh, you have to first ask yourself: Are you a data fiduciary, which mm -hmm. means the person who makes the decisions of what data is collected, why it is collected, how it will be processed and and uh, retained. If mm -hmm. you're making those decisions, you're the fiduciary. Mm -hmm. However, if mm -hmm. you're a payment gateway who simply just processes the transaction, for example, then you're mm -hmm. a processor. Mm -hmm. right? You don't get to make the decisions of what data needs to be collected, so on and so forth. Right? Yeah. yeah. So in our concept, in our context, uh, from a, uh, what I told you about what Perfuse does, we mm -hmm. essentially carry out processing in instructions on behalf of, let's say, an SBI or, a, or an HDFC bank. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationship is very clear and we've been in fairly intense conversations internally and with our clients to figure out, you know, 
how we should mm-hmm. reorient ourselves to this new law. Uh, one thing mm-hmm. is clear that these financial institutions, for the right reasons, continue to be the data fiduciaries. Yeah. Uh, people yeah. like us, people like, let's say, maybe a razor pay, so on and so forth, until they get licensed, uh, continue mm-hmm. to be your uh, uh, processor. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it makes sense. I mean, so you are the data processors and the endpoints uh, will be the fiduciaries. Correct. And is it is it fair to say that this uh, Privacy Act is applicable more to the fiduciaries in terms of their handling of data than to the processors or it goes both ways? No, it's uh, it's scope is limited to fiduciaries. Okay. And almost every fiduciary is ca- covered by, let's say, in the banking industry, there is something called an IT outsourcing guidelines. Right. Okay. Um, so it is the fiduciary's job to make sure that any processor or third party that they use to handle mm-hmm. processing or whatever of data, there is mm-hmm. adequate supervision, audit trails, so on and so forth, <clears throat> and you know, no data commingling, all 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 the things that you know, yeah. uh, things that uh, go through the audit part. So, yeah. so the regulators and the uh, policymakers are very clear that listen, we don't have the capacity to supervise and monitor hundreds of thousands of entities or lakhs of entities, right? Mm-hmm. People mm-hmm. catch the fiduciaries whose business depends on this data, make mm-hmm. sure that they kind of, you know, uh, behave responsibly. Okay, makes sense. So, so there is a 50 crore fine that I keep hearing about, 50 crores to have. Uh, can you can you explain when will that fine kick in or uh, businesses? I mean, any businesses which is a data fiduciary. In fact, I would even extend it to SaaS companies. All the SaaS companies are getting the trust of their customer for some service they are offering, and in return, they are storing some data, CRM systems or any 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 software service company has some form of customer data. Does this? extend to any data fiduciary, not restricted just to financial institution? And what will any businesses, a SaaS business, will have to worry about in the context of this act? Is there something for them to worry about or only financial institutions now? No, no, it's any any business that deals with PII. Okay. Right, And that scope is as wide as that. I mean, uh, yes, the... The how you answer the question, are you a fiduciary or a processor, will be very contextual to that industry. I just gave you an example from the industry that I know. Okay. But I'm sure there are uh, tons of such examples in any other industry, healthcare, telecom, insurance, whatever you talk about. Right? Yeah. So the scope is not really limited to just the financial service industry. If you're any business, uh, whether you're a software business, uh, you could be even a distribution business, whatever business you're in. If you're handling customer data, if you're handling a PIR, you could be an entertainment platform, OTT platform, right? You could mm-hmm. be storing user credentials. You're a fiduciary, right? Yeah. Um, and to your point, should they worry about, absolutely, it's a life and death kind of a thing, right? So 50 crore is a big number, boss, for a lot of us. For, yeah. you know, I don't know, 80% of the businesses in their respective industries, 50 crore is a big it's number. Just it's a, that shut down. A startup a, can get shut down. Yeah. It's an extinction. It's an extinction kind of yeah. scale of event, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, to be fair, I think the there was a lot of noise and hue and cry from the industry on mm-hmm. boss. I mean, what are we what are we saying? 50 crore, 250 crore, and all this stuff. So the minister was very candid in how he responded. He said that this is exactly the reaction that we want from businesses. To be aware that out of over out of you know not uh, out of let's say carelessness or even malintent, if you happen to lose customer data and break the law, there is a there is a you know life ending event that can happen, right? So yeah, I, 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 very very yeah, and if you do the right things, then you don't have to worry about it. I mean. If you are doing the right things and you have the right process in place, and in yeah. spite of that, let's say something happens, would there be a, or is it just a black and white that if there's a data leakage, you had to be 50 crore fine, or you had a data leakage or some personal identifiable information gets breached, but they are still doing the right things. 
that's where the concern is right i'm still a responsible okay. business try to do all the right things in place and yet api get leaked leaked so what is it from a process standpoint or something is is there something that uh, we, there is clarity or we will have to go through an iteration to make that up good question i think it's still work in progress what the what we have is just the uh, umbrella law right? okay the umbrella law is designed for for three things one is its universal universality of application okay right to its simplicity of expression you should go through the act it's one of the simplest english you know documents that i've read okay. um, you know it, it doesn't have this here so forth and not with standing english and legal kind of, don't go hand in hand but it's good to have a legal framework with an english like uh, simplicity with an english like simplicity right yeah um, and it's intentionally drafted in a way that you know it can very quickly keep up with uh, changes in technology right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but what they've left uh, left to be implemented is the rule mm-hmm. we, we need to draw a line between policy and rules what yeah. we have is a policy we have the act we don't yet have the rules and that has been left to a yet to be created data protection board um, mm-hmm. so that's the next level of activity that uh, engagement is now happening between industry and and the policy makers saying okay give us feedback in what should be the construct of the board what should be the skills that the board has and uh, mm-hmm. no surprises uh, data protection cyber security is a key key you know skill set that that, uh, that uh, board needs and that board okay. um, charter is to be an adjudicator mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. not the not in the form and manner of let's say a reserve bank of india which is a financial regulator Mm-hmm. that's not the scope of that regulator that that board is simply there to say that okay this customer made a complaint against this institution that they misused my data right mm-hmm. and there is a process of inquiry and a final outcome on that right okay. or there could be a self reporting by an institution exactly to your point very well intentioned mm-hmm. very reputed mm-hmm. got all the right processes efforts and systems in place yet something happened mm-hmm. right there is a uh, provision for a voluntary disclosure saying that oops yeah. this happened right? okay yeah uh, so it's hard to predict think, uh, you know we can probably take some uh, probably take some inspirations from pci as well pci did uh, exactly uh, uh, to some extent there is a process in place uh, there is a checklist of things to be done uh, in the, the example you gave whether you are an uh, processor or a fidu- the the fiduciary or the uh, user like the, the example in the pca case for the technology we provide we are actually mm-hmm. an intermediary mm-hmm. we are not mm-hmm. storing the data but we still are subjected to the audits for each one of our customers uh, because all the intermediaries gets has to go through the audit so we you know what we said we don't want to go through this for each of our customers we ended up becoming a pci certified pci compliant organization yeah pci yeah. compliant yeah. organization as well uh, but there is a process in place and uh, and uh, yeah it basically mitigates the risk uh, i think that level of clarity is yet to be is work in progress it's just that there is an umbrella law which says there is up to up to 50 crores of fine or is Correct. it 50 crores to something or is it up to 50 crores what is it 50 crore is the starting point I minimum mean, it's a starting right. point so it's more than that yeah it it's can go up to 250 crore for certain egregious breaches okay and for an organization it is capped at a 500 crore number so wow. if <laughs> something really serious and egregious and you know it's demonstrable that uh, there was a lot of you know unfixed loopholes or sometimes even willful ignorance or 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 you know uh, processing beyond the scope of the law right so in 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 a nutshell you are i the analogy i can think of is and i had this from another uh, podcast i did with uh, a financial institution tech head he said that any software vendor or saas company should think of themselves as a bank like just like bank thinks of their customers money mm-hmm. the software vendor should think of themselves as custodians of data of the customers data right and and it Got comes it. with a certain and data is the is is got a monetary aspect to it lot more in today's world than in the past right so and this act to some extent is a step in the right direction to bring that sense of responsibility 
across all players and then absolutely. eventually we will evolve to make it better absolutely i think uh, you nailed it because you know till now there's been always this you know smart uh, two liners that you hear data is a new oil so on and so forth yeah. right yeah, yeah. <coughs> excuse me but uh, for the first time you know just like there are rules in handling money mm -hmm. we're now going to get rules in how to handle data and data yeah right and yeah. what happens if you if you misbehave intentionally or otherwise and you know what happens from a monetary perspective so i think uh, people start drawing those straight lines between how they handle data and you know something as simple as a pnl yeah okay yeah, fantastic very very insightful uh, conversation uh, srikanth really I, I i learned a lot i want to i want to give a loaded two questions combined into one to you okay uh, of course account data aggregation data is going to be uh, central to everything that we do today right and and i'm also seeing a perfect storm that is happening at least in india right you mm -hmm. had upi you had companies like perfios which is trying to bring very compelling use cases around data aggregation mm -hmm. and i also see things like ondc ocen open mm -hmm. networks for digital commerce yeah open yeah. credit enablement network I mean, fundamentally, right. these are all standardized protocols for exchanges between individual entities or stakeholders in a specific use case ecosystem to exactly. be able to share data and take decisions quickly and benefit right. the consumers, right? Right. Uh, you also have a perfect storm that is building up to give productivity boost and speed boost for things like LLMs, co-pilots, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. speed between a thought process to something being a viable productized use case is becoming shorter and shorter Absolutely. because of this open networks, easy exchange of data, and LLM-based use cases that can be built on top of that. And then yeah. you have co-pilots, which is uh, all these new things that is coming up. It's a perfect storm that is brewing up in terms of the speed at which some unprecedented innovation is going to happen. Absolutely. Now, now, it's going to also come with a lot of unknown risks. Completely. The speed at which exploits and unknown risks can happen and the use cases is also something that worries us. So I think I'm going to ask you uh, two questions. One is, is it fair to say that central to any kind of business security is applications and the data it deals with and you take care of the risks and mitigating those risks? It will, you are to a large extent, you are mitigating the risk. And how do you build a culture of mitigating those unknown threats, right? As we go ahead mm -hmm. with all this great business use cases that is building up, mm -hmm. how do you build a culture of mitigating them? And finally, how do we position and transform this entire threat to not be worried about it, but it's if you do the right things, it's an enabler for your business. I, as a business owner, how do I, how do you, Take all these things together and give a simple message that, yeah, it enables your business by taking care of security. Right? It's a pretty wow. loaded question. If you want me to repeat Absolutely. that, I can repeat that. There are multiple points in that, but yeah, I want your, I want your views on that. That's very, very insightful and actually a minefield, not from a question answer perspective, but if I were a business owner, there's a minefield that everybody needs to cross. Yeah. The first, uh, the answer to your first question is actually the simplest about mm -hmm. how do I think about application and data security right? Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the context of running a business? Mm -hmm. My view to that, to that is a little old fashioned and very simplistic that if you can't keep your data secure, you shouldn't be in business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. as black and white as that. If mm -hmm. you have even an iota of doubt that maybe this application doesn't meet the rigors of whatever security systems that you follow, mm -hmm. don't be in that business. Mm -hmm. Because yep. uh, very quickly you'll find that whatever short-term benefits that you might expect from all this Cambrian explosion of data and, uh, and capabilities, mm -hmm. they will not pay back for an extinction-like event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you yeah. lose data. Right? Yeah. Till now, you, till now, actually, you know, you could you could have gotten away with it. Mm -hmm. Now there is a law which holds you accountable. Mm -hmm. And there is law enforcement through the data protection board that is coming in. Mm -hmm. So, it, yes, there are a lot of businesses today which deal with data, which are not up there in terms of security and, uh, you know, uh, privacy protocols. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, simple. I think the simple message to such a <coughs> business businessman or entrepreneur is mm-hmm. uh, you should have started worrying yesterday. Today is mm-hmm. today is second best, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, start thinking of start doing a complete audit and inventory of all your processes and systems that touch data, right from the time that you s- contact a customer, even going down to querying. Where did I get my sales leads database from? What was this? You know, how was it procured? Right? Mm-hmm. Did the customer consent to be in that uh, database, so on and so forth? It's 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 uh, it's going to be messy and it's going to be hard. There's no going away mm-hmm. from that. Mm-hmm. In order to be prepared to continue to doing business in this new regime, your first starting mm-hmm. point is do a complete audit. I mean, where all are my data points coming from? How am I processing it? Who are the mm-hmm. different user groups and you know departments in my company that have access to what kind of data? Do they mm-hmm. need uh, you know a 16-digit card number or just the redacted last four four digits? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Some yeah. as fundamental as that, as simple to implement yeah. but overlooked. Right. Yeah. And finally, yeah. what is my data storage policy? Right. All mm-hmm. of that stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, the first and most immediate call to action would be to start you know doing the self introspection. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, the bigger the business and the and the bigger the line, you know, number of uh, lines of business, it gets mm-hmm. complicated. Uh, mm-hmm. But there's no going away from it. Mm-hmm. Two is as I think as a process of natural selection, you will find that um, the overall quality of businesses, entrepreneurs, um, data fiduciaries that survive. Mm-hmm. will be of an order of magnitude higher or better quality mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. in terms of how they handle data it's a yeah. it, it's going to be darwinian in the short term yeah 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 right? absolutely yeah those who survive will actually mm-hmm. be those who will earn customer trust will mm-hmm. start building on top of that right? mm-hmm. uh, will enjoy will start enjoying scale benefits because if 20 of your competitors died by the roadside because mm-hmm. you know for whatever reason yeah, yeah. Then obviously your scale economics also pick up. So uh, these are some of the things that um, you know CIOs and I would say even boards need to recognize. Yeah. Right? yeah. Saying that dealing with security and privacy is not just uh, another compliance check mark. Mm-hmm. It's a whole new way of resetting a mental model. Yeah. And looking yeah. at it as uh, both uh, threat avoidance. Yeah. Yeah. As well as a booster to you know uh, two years down the line. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I think uh, you you the key word I picked up from it, and it's a key word that has resonated in the last uh, few podcasts I did. I did a recent one with a head of product security with HubSpot. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, long back, I did a webinar with the country director of India uh, from PayPal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, today I'm doing it with another uh, potentially ambitious, lofty goal of being the UPI for data, which is Perfuse, which is already a unicorn. And the mm-hmm. key theme that I heard across all those three things on why security should be a business enabler for your apps was trust. Because what is Absolutely. going to happen is your customers will start placing their trust on you if you deal with their data and the applications on which they are placed their trust on you demonstrate you're dealing with in a safe, transparent, proactive manner, you will gain their trust and hence it is an enabler for a business. And it's as simple as that. You do it because it's the right thing to do to gain trust. Absolutely right. I mean, uh, I mean, if you pair it down even much more simplistically, ultimately business runs on trust. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And this is one form of trust, right? So so absolutely. I mean, uh, you said it well. I, I, I can't improve on that. Yeah. And then, of course, you have the stick of the law also that is going to force people who are a little bit on the edge to take a short term approach will be very careful not to take it. And hence, an overall trust and overall ecosystem will build. Uh, That was fantastic. I don't think I could have asked for a better person to uh, lay down what this act means, given that you are the co-chair. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Srikant. Pleasure having you here. Uh, Any closing thoughts, Srikant? Any closing thoughts? Uh, thank you for having me, Venkatesh. It's been a super, super uh, interaction with you. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers.